um, he's here with us tonight. Uh, this is a, a prayer I shared with our staff meeting today. It was written by um, Howard Thurman, the Reverend Dr. Howard Thurman, that some of you may be familiar with. Uh, big civil rights uh, person here in this country and uh, profound, uh, profound um, muse for um, Martin Luther King Jr. among others. So this is called, Lord, Lord, open unto me. Open unto me light from my darkness. Open unto me courage from my fear. Open unto me hope from my despair. Open unto me peace from my turmoil. Open unto me joy from my sorrow. Open unto me strength from my weakness. Open unto me wisdom for my confusion. Open unto me forgiveness for my sins. Open unto me tenderness for my toughness. Open unto me life, love for my hates. Open unto me thyself for myself. Lord, Lord, open unto me. And I'm happy to send that prayer along to anybody who, who would like it. So tonight, um, yeah, okay, Carol, happy to do that. I will, I will just uh, send it out to all, the, all of us who are here tonight. Um, hi, Sally. Hi, Cheryl. Hi, Akiko. Just trying to um, acknowledge everybody as, as we come on. Uh, tonight, we have Yusuf Miller. Uh, as our speaker tonight from Lenten University, more in common, we think. Actually, um, when we did, when we attempted to do this series last year, and then obviously COVID happened, uh, Yusuf was our first speaker and he was awesome. Um, he, he spoke to us, he answered the questions, which I'm gonna ask him again, but also um, was very open to answering any questions people had and um yeah, we just yeah. learn from one another so let me tell you a little bit about him. he is a, a board member of his mosque and member of the racial reconciliation justice coalition of san diego <laughs> and active in the interfaith community services and um and he maybe wants to speak to it later. Very, very active in terms of how we deal with environmental justice. And so um, Yusuf comes to us with a lot of interest and a lot of expertise. Yeah. This is time to know because Allison, ask everyone to mute other than their speak. We'll do. Okay, please, everybody mute if you're not speaking. Thank you. There'll be time for there'll be time for um, questions, a lot of questions. And and by the way, if you have questions in the meantime, please type them in the chat so we can get to them as as Yusuf speaks. Um, anyway, so as I was saying, Yusuf was with us uh, last year, and so I'm so grateful that he's willing to do it again. Um, things got a little confusing uh, with COVID, and so we had to stop some stuff, but. Um, Thank you, Yusuf, especially um, given that you're not feeling 100%. So Yusuf, the first question is, what is your faith tradition's basic beliefs and practices and how are they lived out? Well, <clears throat> thank you for having me. Uh, I wanna say peace and blessings out to everyone. Uh, as said before, I'm Yusuf Miller. And to the question, what are the belief practices and how are they lived out? If I could summarize that, if I summarize that ac accurately, that our our faith is based on really three real principles. I mean, it's encapsulated in five uh, articles of belief of faith, but it's humanity, it is environmentalist, and it is um, animal rights activism. These three things, I would say, encapsulates all of. Our, our faith tradition after belief in one God in his service. Uh, 
So to describe how we believe in that one God and service to that one God, I encapsulate in our relationship with other human beings, whether it's family, friends, neighbors, our relationship with the environment, whether we uh, keep clean earth, clean air, clean rivers and streams, and our, our relationship with the other animals, which are also our neighbors. So um, there are traditions and hadith of the prophet, peace and blessed be upon him, that, that describe the uh, blessings and reward of paradise for a woman for simply giving a thirsty dog in the desert something to drink. And it was such a pure act. It was such an act that she suffered from for seeing another living creature suffer that bad that that, that connection actually opened paradise and everything else she did was forgiven. Now, I don't want me, people to think that, hey, when you see a dog, just give him a bowl of water and hey, I'm good. No, it was the actual connection with that animal, the actual pain she went with was so pure that it opened all of paradise for her. So, and, and then there's another tradition where a man did the exact same thing. <clears throat> so this is, uh, I would classify in a nutshell, after our worship in relationship with, with God, we learn through the prophets, our relationship to other human beings, the environment, and the other creatures that live on this planet with us. Wow. So um, I'm curious because, uh, once again, this is ignorance. But when you speak to the, the prophet or um, Allah, that you always say, peace be upon him. What is, what is the, um, the spirituality of that? Uh, thank you so much for that question. We use a lot of honorific terms when we speak of these beloved and blessed memory people and for the creator of the heavens and earth. For example, when we say Allah, which is just the Arabic word for God, we say uh, there's various things you can say, but normally we say Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. That means God, the, the most gracious and the most high. And we, we also say Allah, um, we say all these different uh, beloved things when we mention uh, the, the name of God. When we mention, let's say Jesus Christ, for example, which we call Isa, we say Isa, alayhi salam. We, alayhi salam means upon him peace. When we say Moses, we say alayhi salam, on him peace. Abraham, alayhi salam, on him peace. And even, the, the prophet to the prophets, which is Gabriel. We say, when we say Gabriel's name, Muslims generally say alayhi salam because he is the non-human prophet to the human prophets. So he is a prophet among us. We consider the angel Gabriel a prophet. But when it comes to Muhammad, we say sallallahu alayhi wasallam, which means peace and blessings be upon him because he is ours, right? So he's the one that, that sets our tradition. And I'm sure that each, each uh, community of each prophet had a certain affinity to their prophet in their time until the other prophet came. And this is our prophet. So we give him a little extra oomph to the blessings when we, when we speak his name. And it is said that if you say peace and blessings be on his soul, after you say the name of the prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, then a garden of all the gardens in paradise, you get a, an extra garden, an additional garden in your garden of gardens. So uh, hopefully we make it there, but if we make it there, we already set all these wonderful gardens. And um, so we're encouraged to say peace and blessings on all the prophets, because we believe all of those prophets are our prophets as well. We are of the Abrahamic tradition of, of Abraham and Moses and Jesus and Muhammad and everything in between, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So when we, when we uh, speak these prophets, we, we take ownership of them, of Moses alayhi salam, of Abraham alayhi salam, and Jesus alayhi salam. If you see a Muslim who doesn't, let's say they're caught up in this drama, Muslim Christian drama, and they take an opportunity to insult Isa alayhi salam, that actually kicks them out of the religion until they leave that. That kicks them out. They cannot 
do that in our religion. So even when I, I walk down the street, sometimes I'll see an old or discarded. One time I saw a, uh, a Bible that was being rained on. That's my book. That's my book too. You know, it was one of those that has the Old Testament and the, and the New Testament together. So it was one of those really big ones. And I just put it out of the rain. Whoever dropped it might come back for it. I kind of tried to wring the water out and I saw some ink coming out. I'm like, I'm making it worse. So I just put it out of the rain because of my respect for the text. So yes, we are very honorific to the prophets who have been before us. So that's, um, actually that's, that's a really beautiful story. And so I'm wondering, um, as, as we look, and I've got other questions of course, but when you look at, from your perspective, the um, relationship between the Quran and the Bible, you know, our, our sacred texts, um, how do they work together? That's a great question. And I was speaking about that question just this past weekend. <clears throat> I teach Islamic studies on the MCRD at the uh, Recruit Depot in San Diego. And that was one of the topics that I was going over. And we Muslims, we cherish four books, mainly four books. The, the first book I'll say is the Quran. I have to say that because that's our book. And that book was delivered to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, peace and blessings be upon him. I won't always use the Arabic for you because it might be cumbersome. That was sent to him by the angel Jibreel alayhi salam. So that's the first book. The second book, now I'll go in order. The next book is the Torah, which was given to Musa alayhi salam or Moses alayhi salam, also delivered by the angel Gabriel, most of it. And, and some of it was directly spoken from God to him, but he's also a prophet of delivering that book to him, alayhi salam. Then we have what we call the Zabur or the Psalms of David, alayhi salam. And we also have lastly, the Injil, which we call the Injil, which is the New Testament. Now the relationship between these two, these three, four, I'm sorry, between these four, is that if you take the three, Moses, alayhi salam, David, alayhi salam, and Jesus, alayhi salam, and you hold up the Quran and think of it as a magnifying glass, that right. we inspect those books through the lens of the Quran. This is our relationship between the books. So for us as Muslims, the Quran is verbatim speech directly from the word of God, which means that it has no error in it. So when we look at our brothers and sisters books over time, they've had uh, different changes and things of that nature, uh, inspired word, you know, may come from one person to a, a different person. We're not saying any of that is bad. What we're saying is when we compare our religion to the other books and how they're expressed is through the lens of the Holy Quran. So there are things in the Torah we don't accept. There's a lot of it that we do. And, but if it contradicts the Quran, then we have to take the Quran. If it agrees with the Quran, then we agree with both. If it neither agrees nor disagrees with the Quran, we can take it or leave it. For example, the, the, the prophet Daniel is not a prophet in the Quran. I love Daniel. I love the story. I love everything about the story of Daniel, but he's not in the Quran. So I can take it or leave it. And the key is I can't force Daniel on other Muslims. So that's how we look at that. When it comes to the Psalms, Psalms is very beautiful, very needy for God, very needy, very, very God-centered. And I, they, you know, for the vast majority of it, it's very acceptable in a, a review through the Quran's lens, you know. And um, when we get to the New Testament, we call the, the Injil. Now here's something I have to clear up a little bit. We call the New Testament, the Injil, as casual conversation. So we can talk the same language. The Injil itself is actually an extinct book, according to the Quran. It's an extinct book that no longer exists. But within the gospels, there are lessons from the Injil, which means directly from Jesus. Vices being from Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, Peter, 
you know, those, those uh, apostles of Jesus. So we, the, in the Quran, the Injil was sent directly to Jesus and he taught from that Injil. That book that doesn't exist. There are no books that, that, that like straight from Jesus. It doesn't exist anymore. But those lessons are in the Injil, in the New Testament. So we call it that and we respect it because those lessons are still there. The miracles we accept, the virgin birth we accept, his blessed mother we accept. We accept all of those things. The only things that where we part ways is his crucifixion and his divinity. But all of the other parts, divinity as far as being the son of God, he's, he's a divine prophet, but being the son of God. So. Uh, when we look through the Quran, we see the variance there from the Quran to our New Testament, brothers and sisters. So uh, when it comes to the crucifixion, uh, Allah says in the Quran, he was not crucified, nor was he killed. So then we have to take the Quranic version. Well, so we believe in, in the Quran that he was rescued in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was rescued. Um, so therefore, uh, also, it says in the Quran that Allah has no uh, sons or daughters and, uh, or husbands and wives. There's nothing but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they, that is where we differ. But with the other lessons that Jesus Christ has spoken, alayhi salam, then we, we follow those. We believe in those because they're also repeated in the Quran, his miracles, his power, his, his ability to raise the dead by God's permission and all these things we accept. So it is one of our books and that casually we call it the Injil, but actually the Injil for us is an extinct book. So of these four books, we hold them in high regard. Now, there can be other books out there, but they weren't mentioned in the Quran. So therefore we can't say 100%, but these four books are mentioned in the Quran. Even the Quran is mentioned in the Quran. So these four books are dutiful for us to respect. And uh, we consider the Quran the pinnacle of books. So it, it makes me think as I was listening to you that um, because our holy texts are so old or so ancient that, um, and so much has happened since then, that there are for all of us, um, new texts, new understandings that have come um, in the many years since then that we, we grapple with, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and you've sort of spoken to this, but um, um, how does Islam do the beliefs and practices of other tra traditions? I mean, um, obviously there's, you know, we are people of the book, you know, for, um, for Christians and for, for the Jewish people, but also let's say Buddhist people or Hindu. I mean, how does, how does Islam take a look at all these things? Islam in Allah has sent us a verse and it's called, the verse is called the Kufar. Now, let me make sure I under, uh, make it clear what Kufar means or a Kafir, someone who doesn't believe. Kufar is not a, necessarily a negative term or insulting term. It just means those who don't believe, basically to give you uh, a breakdown. We have a whole chapter, it's a short chapter. And it says, they will not believe what you believe you will not believe what they're believing. They will not in the future basically say, believe what you're believing and you must not believe what they're believing. Then it says at the conclusion, to them, their religion, to you, your religion. That for me settles everything, that they have their religion and we have our religion. Allah also tells us in the Quran, Allah says, do not hate a people, do not, do not, I'm sorry, let me back up. It says, oh, do not allow your hatred for a people cause you to transgress the boundaries of justice. And then it screams, it, it, it has a, a phrase in Islam or it's written in a way that screams at people. And it, it's like putting an exclamation point at, after something. Then Allah says, he screams, be just. And then he closes it with justice is closer to piety. So even if we disagree with someone, even if we, we take that disagreement to their religion or their faith, the so wide difference that we cannot allow that to go to an extent where we are not just to other people's religion. 
Allah also says, he continues in another part of Quran, do not make fun of others for those people may be better than you. So Allah tells us not to, to uh, disparage other people for their religion. Allah also says in the Quran, he says, he says, oh, sorry, one second. I have to plug my phone up, it's about to die. But he says, before I go uh, to do that, he says that, I'm sorry, I'm getting the word, let me get the word straight. He says, um, No problem. Do not, he, he says, do not insult a person in their religion, for in their ignorance, you know how people are, they self-defense, right? In their ignorance, they will then assault, insult Allah. So we can't even, if they have a different religion and it's weird to us, maybe they worship a boot. I'm not making a, uh, a joke about that. Maybe they worship a watermelon. I'm not making a joke about that. But if we find those things funny, we as Muslims in the Quran from the lips of our Lord says, do not make fun of them because human nature, when you say something about someone's mother, let's say, they're going to say something about your mother. It's just you cause them to transgress the boundary of of, of clear thinking and righteousness by hurting them. So it is forbidden for us to insult a person's belief in that way. And when we find on YouTube or when we find in the news or a blog or something like that, when you find those things happening, because they do happen, they are un-Islamic. That's powerful. So um, you've, you've already sort of spoken to this and um, I just want to, go a little deeper um so the principles of your faith tradition help um help and and, and i i just have to say it up front um uh, you know there's there's this stereotype about some muslims that are that they are not peacemakers but um you saw from my relationship with you you are very much a peacemaker and and your understanding of the quran is very much um as that islam is a religion of peace so can you speak to that? Yes. Um, one of the talks that I give at the MCRD, since they're, they're Marines, I give them a preview of the next topic I'm going to talk to the next day. And I say, the next class, I'm going to speak about, um, about terrorism in the Muslim community and indifference in, in the Muslim community. Whenever I say that, the room is packed. People who've never come to the class, come to the class. So this is a very important topic because we are the ones who have to clear this misunderstanding up. Not you, not anyone else is not Muslim. It's not your job to go search out these things, which we should as intelligent sentient beings, but we need to make this clear. Allah throughout the Quran forbids us from harming and terrorizing other people. It forbids, not only the Quran, the hadith of the prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, did the exact same thing because he followed the Quran. All of his, he was a walking Quran. For example, there were some Christians from a place called Najran. They came to visit the prophet and they wanted to convince him of Christianity, to accept Christianity because Islam was new on the scene and they wanted to encourage him to follow Christianity. When they got there, they, you know, raise their case. And the prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, explained to him Islam and uh, what we believe and invited them to the same. You know how people do, right? So they invited each other. So the Christians said, we will not change our faith. And the, the Muslims, of course, the prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, said, we will not change our faith. This is our faith. And then he responded to them, just like the verse I read to you, to you, your religion, to, uh, uh, to us, ours. He sent them away. They went back to Nedran and he sent them with the covenant of protection and a covenant of relationship. It wasn't like, get them, bring out the swords and all this kind of stuff. They won't believe like we believe. How dare them? That's not from Islam. It's not from the Quran. It's not from the habits of the prophet, peace and blessing be upon him. When he went to the city of Medina, when he first went there, they asked him to come. He made a constitution protecting the rights of Christians and the rights of Jews in Medina. So I often ask people, 
Is that what you see in the YouTube? Is that what you see on Facebook? Is that what you see in the news? They don't see that in the news. Those things are un-Islamic. They're not from the prophet. They're not from the creator. So then this has been injected into the faith. And we pay the price when people see us. Uh, I remember one time I was in Afghanistan and um, I sneezed. And I said, you know, Muslims, when we sneeze, we say, Alhamdulillah, all praises due to God. And it's kind of like, you know, you guys, when we, they say, God bless you, or, or you know, that, that kind of thing. We say, Alhamdulillah. So when I said, Alhamdulillah, since I was speaking Arabic, everybody stopped. And they just stared at me like something else was going to happen. And I'm like, I just sneezed, you know, it's tradition for us to do this. But that, that feeling comes from these guys because the expression that's most popular about Islam is what they get off Fox News, or what they get off of YouTube, or what if they get off of some blog. But all of those things are contradicting the Quran, which is the verbatim speech of the creator of heavens and earth. And they contradict the habits and traditions of the prophet, peace and blessing be upon him. So uh, this, this is how I normally discuss this topic where the prophet uh, reacted to uh, the, the people who are not Muslim in this way. So Yusuf, can you please tell us from your perspective, because I think one of the most misunderstood terms is jihad. Um, okay. I remember hearing um, uh, Imam Taha talk about that and it, it was so illuminating. And um, I think it might be helpful to hear it from your perspective. Yes, jihad is, is struggle. Jihad doesn't mean war. It, it became uh, commonly placed in that, in that terminology, but it really does disservice to the actual term, jihad. Now, there's a minor jihad and there's major jihad. The major jihad is waking up in the morning to pray, fasting during the month of, month of Ramadan, giving charity. These are major jihads not responding with insult when someone insults you. These are major jihads. And when it comes to minor jihads, these are uh, struggling against other people. And it's still not war, it's just struggling against other people. So th there's a different term in, in Arabic for that, but this is jihad. And I'll tell you, the biggest jihad that people can have is the well two that I find, especially for me, is fasting during the month of Ramadan and waking up for Fajr. Every morning is Fajr. Before the sun comes up, you have to wake up, wash your face, your hands up to the wrist, your arms up to the elbows. So this is waking you up, definitely. You can't, you wanna go back to sleep, but, and then it washes your ankles and your feet, uh, wiping over your head, rinsing your mouth out, then going and praying to your Lord, then, the sun is not even up every day. It's hard. The bed calls you. The bed calls you back. It's almost as if it's living. I'm just telling you from my experience. It's like dragging you. It's like, no, don't go. And I'm like, come on, man. But still, it's a, it's, it's a relationship with the bed. It is the hardest jab, especially when it's, clo it's cold outside and you're warm under the blankets. Uh, getting out of the bed is such a jihad. And this is the way we've always discussed jihad until the modern period. Jihad has always been discussed this way. My, uh, jihad of eating or not eating during the month of Ramadan, especially in a non-Muslim country, everybody's popping a Snickers, everybody's drinking some Coca Pepsi, everybody's eating a pizza all day long. This is our country all day long, and they we people offer, you know, people offer. And when I used to be in um, the military, and we had a going away luncheon for someone during Ramadan. The way I occupied myself is I was in control of the conversation. Everybody else stuff in their face and I'm either making people laugh or telling them a story, you know, military type story. And that way I don't have to focus on it. But jihad does not mean holy war. It doesn't and it never has meant holy war. So <clears throat> it simply means struggle and that struggle can come in many forms, including holy war, because that is also a struggle, but that's not, the root of the word. So it, it is a modern use of that word. And, and it's along with the modern use of the word uh, uh, Sharia, 
Sharia is another one that's taken out of Arabic Islamic context. So, so please say more about that. Okay, Sharia. The Sharia has a, a, a beautiful story behind it as well. Sharia is a word that means, it doesn't mean law. It doesn't mean law at all. It means a street or a road or a boulevard. So Islamically, well, Sharia existed before there was Islam. And people talked about their cattle going down to Sharia or uh, here comes my brother from a long travel up to Sharia. You know, it, it's, it means road, right? But when Islam came in, Sharia meant a road that goes to a well. So this is religiously speaking, a road that goes to a well and this well is bottomless. And this well has the sweetest, freshest, coldest water you could ever refresh yourself with. This is Sharia in the Muslim mind. So when someone says, are you for Sharia? And I say, yes. They're like, oh no, he's a terrorist, he's a bin Laden, he's a this or that. But in Islam, it's not a negative word, just like uh, jihad. So the when people say Sharia, it's a huge, huge word. Sharia tells me how to pray, how to fast, how to dress, how to brush my teeth. It tells me how to interact with women, men, my children. Sharia is, in, all of that is included in Sharia. So when a person comes to someone and says, I hope you're not one of those Sharia people, it doesn't make sense linguistically to us as Muslims. Sharia governs everything we do. Everything is, is, is governed by Sharia. So what they mean is, do we accept uh, burying women up to their neck and throwing stones at them and things of this nature, which they may see in some other country, Iraq, Iran, Iran or something like this. But I tell them, that's not in the Sharia. It's not even in the Sharia. So, it, and, and we use, when I really talk about that concept of Sharia versus Allah's Sharia, I don't even use the prophet Muhammad, peace and blessed be upon him. I use Jesus, alayhi salam. And I use the story of Jesus when he, he met the woman who they claim was caught in adultery. He, they brought her in and they said they caught her red-handed, meaning they caught her in the act. But Jesus is a master. He's, he's a prophet of God. He's, he's the most magnificent human being. He's the most magnificent person on the scene at the time. He understands that if you caught her red-handed, why is she alone? You're up to no good. So they bring this woman. And then they say, we caught her red-handed. And if he says, go ahead and kill her then because the Sharia, which we can just use these terms, right? The Sharia, the rules of Judaism is adultery. Someone is caught in adultery to stone. If he says do that, then they will say, oh, you're not this peaceful messenger that, that you've come and love and, and, and respect. And if he says, let her go, then you're breaking the rules. You're breaking the laws of, of Moses in the Old Testament. So instead of that, because he's such a beautiful master, he, he starts writing in the sand. Now, People have a lot of theories. This is not a, a proof, but people have a lot of theories on what he wrote. And I like this particular theory. Now, like I said, this is just Yusef, and this is not the theory. The, the fact is he wrote in the sand. This is in the verses of the, of the uh, Bible. Some people say he wrote, uh, let's say one guy named was John, John and Mary. And he's just writing, and then he erases it with his stick. And then John looks over his shoulder and be like, oh, he knows. The reason why we know she's the lady of the evening because we've been hanging out with her. And then Craig and Mary and erases it when Craig looks over his shoulder. And because why is this important? Now we go back to the law. The law says, if you, if you uh, harm someone for a death penalty and that person was innocent or uh, you falsely accuse them at the time, you get the exact same punishment they get. It's the same in Islam. So if they would have killed her, that's why he said, let he who without sin, John and Craig and all you guys, let who without the sin cast the first stone at her. And then you killed that person and you're guilty of the same sin, sin, then people have to cast a stone at you and kill you as well. So then they probably thought in their minds, should we, is she, is my life worth taking her life is not, I'm leaving. 
I'm out of here. I'm out of here. I use this story to, sh to say that if the, the rule is the same in Islam, and if they were just by bearing all these women up to their heads and their necks in these countries, then there should be a man right next to them. There's not. So this is a crime against women in those Muslim countries because you have to have a partner in adultery. And the rule for adultery is not stoning to death. It's not stoning to death in Islam. It's lashes, they're lashes, but it's, it's not a death sentence. So there's a lot of problems with that as far as saying that this is an example of Sharia. It's not in the Quran anywhere. It's not from the prophet, peace and blessing be upon him. It's, it's, um, it's one of those uh, false claims against Islam because Muslims are doing it. Islam and Muslims can sometimes be two totally different things. There can be Muslims that do the worst things, worst things when we say that Islam is a beautiful religion with terrible followers. And I think any of our faith traditions can say, can make the same claim. So um, this, is, this is Sharia. Sharia is a beautiful thing that governs our life. How to be Muslim is in our Sharia. We get our Sharia from the Quran, the authentic Hadith of the Prophet, peace and blessed be upon him, are the major sources of Sharia. Um, thank you for that. I mean, gosh, just, I feel like inarticulate, but um, yes, we all have our, our people who are beautiful examples and some not so much. And, uh, but to say Sharia is actually a beautiful thing, it's good for us to hear this. And so when we, when we, have conversations with people say, no, no, there's so much more we need to live. Um, before I go on, uh, do people have questions? I don't want to um, monopolize this. Now I'm sure you've got some, this is a good group. <laughs> Bob, it looks like you are, um, you're, you're, you're muted. Yeah, I could say what I was going to, I was going to try to write it in chat, but um, I was interested to hear from you, Seth, about how um, you and uh, your fellow Muslims address uh, environmental justice. You mentioned that that's one of the major sort of areas of focus of, um, of the Muslim r religion and, and of your, I assume of your, your life and your practice. And I, I wonder if you could give us some examples of how that plays out in your life. Yes, in my life, um, <clears throat> I am a member of, of Clean Earth for Kids, which <laughs> is a, uh, a group of awesome kids and, <laughs> and a, a, uh, an adult, a moderator or adult guide, uh, Suzanne Hume. And we have this beautiful connection with clean earth and the environment, whereas it addresses the animal component, it addresses the clean air and the clean water component as they relate to uh, laws, legislations and, and policies that we need to change for the betterment of human beings. And we also look at it as a racial component the racial component of clean earth and, and environmental justice has a racial component and a economic component for people in poverty levels. And those mostly include uh, black and brown peoples and our indigenous brothers and sisters. And um, the places where they live are higher in, highly impacted by environmental toxins, air, poor water, uh, we can look at Flint, Michigan, we can look at the access pipelines, and we can look at roads that go through low income areas where trucks are able to, to travel. Also with the less greenery and, and cooling waters and ponds that are in low income areas versus wealthier areas that are very beautiful and green and a lot of, a lot of uh, flowers and things like this and, and shade trees. So this affects our youth and our elderly the most. When it comes to tolerances for heat and tolerances for uh, congested air, it affects them the most. We see nowadays where children are, uh, are reacting to, um, to 
to air pollutants, asthma, things of these natures. And how does that compact what we're doing today? When it comes to a COVID-19, we have a, a community of people who live in smog and live in these types of areas with respiratory problems, and now they're more susceptible to COVID-19. So the environment really is, it, it belongs to everyone, right? It, it, it extends across the whole planet, but there are also micro environments, depending on your, your ethnicity and your income level, which have a lot of disparity. So we try to focus on those. Now, to tie that back into Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran that do not destroy trees and fruit bearing uh, trees. This is injustice, that we need to make sure that we preserve the environment, but well, for no reason. Of course, you can, you can construct with, with these things, but do not destroy for no reason. Do not cause uh, mishaps upon the earth. So when people have these access pipelines and they spill just because they're trying to make money, this is against Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he created Adam and Eve, he gave them charge over the animals and the gardens. So this automatically from the inception of human beings that we are supposed to be the caretakers of Adam and Eve to take care of themselves, each other, which is humanitarian, to take care of the animals that are in the garden, which is animal rights activism, and to take, maintain the garden itself, which is environmental. There's rivers, there's trees, there's plants, and, and things of this nature. So from the outset of the human experience, we believe that this is charge of Adam and Eve and all of their descendants is to be eco-friendly. And not just as a good idea, but as a mandate from our Lord. Yeah, it's it's a, from what I'm hearing, um, Yusef, it's, it's actually a key part of being um, what it means to be uh, a spiritual person or a person on this earth, right? Yes, it, it, it is. Um, we have this responsibility and we're judged by that responsibility. And we're going to be asked, what did you do with all of these blessings that your Lord has given you? People don't make, they don't take the time to experience the breeze on their face. A lot of times we're just so busy, right? Or the warmth on your cheek from the sun or mm. a, a ocean spray, right? We don't take this time to look at the beauty of the flowers and trees and things like that. We don't see as the phrase go, the forest for the trees. We don't, but that is how we live in connection with our environment because they have the same creator. And these things have a life within them as well. So there are there also are living beings on this planet and there are neighbors. Every bush is our neighbor, every grass is our neighbor, every butterfly, flower, dog, cat, lizard, they're all our neighbors. And we are judged on how we interact with our neighbors if we're going to be a reflection of the mercy of God. This is the mercy of the Lord. So Yusuf, I won't tell anybody, but you almost sound Buddhist. Um, <laughs> so, um, Sally, you've got your hand up. Yes. Um, in the Christian faith, um, there's a lot of difference between um, how we look at the Bible. For, um, some are considered fundamentalists. It's very literal. And mm -hmm. other, it's more contextual. So um, Episcopalians are more contextual. So you look at the context and then you interpret uh, the scripture. Is there anything like that in the Muslim community? And then the second question I have is, how do you look at the LGBTQ in terms of social justice in, in the Muslim world? So two things. Uh... Okay, so when it comes to the, the, the interpretation of the Quran, the Quran comes in four different modes, all in the same book. It is prose, which is direct speech. It is literal in that direct speech. It's also figurative and it's also poetry, poetic. So there's no way to really take the Quran as a whole book and be ultra literal and mm -hmm. still do the Quran justice in its beauty. Because Allah says in the Quran, throughout the Quran, that people are like this 
and good people are like this and bad people are like this. They're not those things. They just tend to be like that. So these are figurative speeches. It's also poetic, a, a verse that I really love from the Quran, it's poetry, but it really means we don't like to use the word poetry in Islam because people think of created made up stuff, right? But in this sense of poetry, Allah says, if you take all the trees on earth and turn them into pins and took all the oceans of the earth and times them by seven, you cannot exhaust the words of your Lord. SubhanAllah, it's such, it's, it's poetic and it's depth, it's, it's unimaginable. You can't exhaust the words of your Lord in his commandment for my heart to beat, my cells to fire, the mitochondria to do what it does, uh, my digestion, my hair to grow, my nails to grow, my hair is not growing so great, but still, even it not growing so great is still by his command. So subhanAllah, it's a very poetic way to say it. But then he also says things that are literal and prose. For example, do not eat pork. You don't need a philosophy major for it. Don't eat it. Fast during the month of Ramadan. You don't need a philosophy major to say, do not eat or drink from dawn to sunset. No philosophy major. So all of these languages are within the Quran. And these languages tend to be very pliable. So we'll get people in all of our traditions that take religious texts and stretch them to uh, mean what they want them to mean. Mm -hmm. But that is inserting meaning into the Quran instead of exegesis, they're doing endogesis, putting words into the Quran's mouth, but the Quran draws out its own meaning from exegesis. And the best exegete of the Quran was the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So I hope I answered your first question. I, I wondered if it divided, you know, um, people, because this tends to divide Christians is this yes. fundamentalism. Yes, we have the biggest divide would be are the people who take matters into their own hands and are terrorists. They go literal on something that is that, that is figurative. Uh, mm -hmm. We've had in our, our past history, I'm sorry to say, uh, it was some one people who took a, um, a saying of the prophet, they took it literally. They were asking about jinn, bad jinn. We can say in Christianity, let's say the word demon. Mm -hmm. They say, okay, how do they present themselves? And he says, usually they'll come as black dogs or black snakes. So unfortunately, mm -hmm. these people went and killed all black dogs in the, in the, in the area. That's mm -hmm. not what the prophet was saying. He wasn't saying that black, black dogs are created by the heavens and earth. Black snakes are created by the heavens and earth. And they require his love to exist but they took it to an extreme and said, to be safe, we're killing all black dogs in our region. So we have people like this, we're divided on these kind of issues. And yes, that plagues all, all traditions and we're not immune from it, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, your second, did I answer your first question? Yes, you did. Okay, your second question, LGBTQ, when it comes to uh, human rights, LGBTQ are Benny Adam, in other words, children of Adam. The, the, nef, the uh, son-in-law and the cousin of the prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, said that there are only two types of people in the whole world. They are your brothers or sisters in Islam, or they're your brothers or sisters in humanity. No one goes below that level. No one. No one. So although we disagree, we are Although we are what, what you call uh, heteronormative, we are heteronormative, we don't apologize for it, but at the same time, the level of humanity that exists for our brothers and sisters who are LGBTQ must be adhered to. Allah also said, like I said earlier, you can't even make fun of a person who has a different belief or a different way of going because in their ignorance, they'll make fun of you. What more do we need as far as harming someone, that's way out of the boundaries. Allah yelled at us. He yelled at us. He said, be just, screamed at us because justice is closer to piety, meaning closer to your Lord. So um, it is true that we, our religion is, is heteronormative, but at the same time, our LGBTQ brothers and sisters are Benny Adam, children of Adam. And they deserve that Benny Adam level of respect. 
So I, I just want to uh, tag on to that because I think this is something that came up last year, Yosef, when you were with us about women. Um, a lot of us don't understand just because it's not part of our, um, our culture about the covering, the job, you know, and then and, and, and various um, ways of dealing with for women. Could you explain some of that for us or for me? Thank you. When it comes to women dress um, and men dress, it's a, a act of modesty. So this dress, this hijab is mentioned in the Quran. And not only is it mentioned in the Quran to do it, why is mentioned in the Quran? So people say Muslim women, they wear this head hair covering because if the prophet sees your hair is disgraced to him or if uh, women, Muslim women are not attractive so they got to cover their face or all these kind of crazy things I've heard. The Quran answers the question that they have to wear it. It makes the statement that they have to wear it and then it, it automatically says why. So Allah says in the Quran, oh you women who believe, take some of your hair covering because everybody covered their hair in the desert because if you've ever been in the desert, a lot of sand blows in your hair and stuff like that and your lips and your eyes. And if you try to eat your food, sand is falling in your food and it feels like you're grinding your teeth on something. But everybody covered their hair. So um, they said, take some of that wrapping and cover your ornaments the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says it. Of course, figurative speaking, we come across a figurative phrase again. Cover your ornaments so that you will be recognized as a pious woman. That's it. Nothing else, nothing else. It's uh, women are subjugated, women are, because at the time, men, a lot of women at that time wore their bodies out, right? Um, and uh, men would see women wearing a certain type of thing and they would know who was the woman of the evening, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said for the believing women to separate themselves from all other women as pious women. As you can see, like certain uh, nuns, when you see nuns, you automatically have a certain image of how they are, how they speak, how they do all kinds of things. So much so that sometimes we put too much emphasis on them. And then we say, oh, you see a nun on roller skates, you'd be like, what, nuns roller skate? Yeah, they're human beings, they have fun, right? Uh, I'm sure there's probably nuns who do all kinds of things, right? But still the idea that they have this sort of chaste, uh, pious lifestyle of, of uh, modesty. So Allah doesn't say anything about their hair is, it doesn't say anything about that. It says that they should be recognized as pious women. And then it's a period there. Our scholars have gone on farther to uh, describe other things that it, the benefits of it, which is if a woman is speaking and she's, her body is covered up, it's not, her shape is not, um, uh, displayed. When she speaks, all you have is what she says, right? You're not distracted by anything else that you're not supposed to be focused on. If she's teaching a class or if she's uh, giving you instructions or things like that, you're more focused on what this human being is saying versus the shape of her positively or negatively. So it has that way of focusing uh, the male mind particularly. So a friend of mine, when I gave her this uh, explanation, she was like, uh, well, Muslim men get to dress in Western clothes. The, the Quran doesn't say they have to wear uh, Arabic clothes. They just have to be modest in their, in their dress, loose fitting, not, uh, not uh, shape conforming. So they said, you get, get guy get to wear Western clothes. How come they don't get to? I'm like, well, first of all, you're putting Western clothes on a pedestal. I don't think I get to wear Western clothes as if it's better than anything else, number one. And number two, the clothes choice is not to uh, oppress her or hold her back. The, 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 it is to actually empower her. And that's what I hear from Muslim women in this country who don't have to wear hijab, it's not the law. They don't wear, have to wear the hijab and they wear it anyway. They say it is empowering to them. It is people uh, focus more on what they're saying. And I get this from them, you know, because I don't have to wear a hijab. But men also have to have an, a, a hijab. It's just not over the hair or the face or anything like that. We have to have hijab in our interaction with women. We have to have hijab in our modesty and action with women and men. So there is a hijab that even men have to follow. We can't walk around with uh, shorts on. That's why people never see me in shorts except in my house. 
because those shorts, especially to come up to mid thigh on a man, that is haram. We can't wear that because it's unnecessary. So uh, the hijab is an article of clothing of piety uh, expressed by the religion and not a, uh, not a uh, oppressive tool or anything of that nature. It reminds me when I was in Israel a couple of years ago that um, we were going to go into uh, the holy city of Jerusalem and the men, it was not just the, the women, but the men had to make sure that their shorts covered their knees. Yes, it's the same in Islam. Um, our shorts, when we do wear them in public, they have to be below the knee. So um, yeah, we have that, that, that same way. Yes. So more questions, but I, um, I don't want to monopolize questions, comments. Um, okay, well then I'm just gonna continue monopolizing. So um, how does your faith tradition embrace contemporary concerns and insights? Um, I, you've talked about um, climate change and um, how you see this is so important. What other things does Islam consider? Um, I know you're, it's, it's a big deal to speak of all of Islam, but um, uh, what do you feel like is looking at the, the primary contemporary concerns right now and how can we deal with them? Well, um, we look at it, a lot of us, we look at it as our duty to be an activist. Like I said, I keep coming back to Allah screaming at us. I think it's funny. And uh, I think it's funny in a religious way, a, a pious way, that he yelled at us to be just. So LGBTQ justice is justice. Uh, Black justice is justice. Indigenous justice is justice. Youth, women, all of these things we're supposed to be in these contemporary social justice activities, Black Lives Matter and things of that nature, as long as they don't cross the boundaries of our religion and the way we express it. So we are commanded to be a mercy to the world. So the prophet, one of his nicknames was the mercy to the world. And we are what's called the ummah of the mercy to the world. So when I bring this up into my Muslim groups, trying to get them more activated, they say, well, Muslims in San Diego is only this small percent of the population. So as long as we meet that, we're not really doing that bad, Brother Youssef. And I'm like, no, we are the mercy to the world. We're supposed to be the leaders. But unfortunately, and, and, and it's not unfortunately, because I, I really praise our Christian brothers and sisters uh, being the leaders in in homeless outreach, in sheltering people, in, in all of these things, all of the, the rights movements, abolition, and all those things started in the church. They should start in the mosque, you know, just from a, a personal Muslim approach, right? It should start in the mosque. The civil rights movement should have started in the mosque. The uh, women's rights should have started in the mosque. They all started in the church. So if we're commanded to be the mercy to all the worlds, then we need to take our rightful place in being represented in justice activity at the border. We need to be justice activities at, at uh, the churches, at the synagogues, at the Sikh temples, at all of these places, we need to be the voice of justice. So these contemporary issues are ones that we should have a great involvement with. Wow, that's powerful. Um, Kate. Um, I know a little bit of Yusuf's background and he does a tremendous amount of work on social justice issues in San Diego. And I was wondering if you could share maybe one or two of the ones that you're most active in, because I think people would be interested in learning about some of the work that you do. Well, thank you for that question. I think the thing that I'm, um, most characterized by other people is uh, the current police reform initiatives that's going on. Uh, in North County, uh, we've been, and throughout the county actually, but particularly in North County, we have been meeting with all the law enforcement agencies, whether it's sheriff or police, to talk about uh, police reform in this new era of policing after George Floyd. And we've met with almost all the cities 
and we've had really receptive types of uh, meetings with them. They just don't know how to go about um, getting started with it. So, not, and that's our job. For example, in Escondido, we just passed the uh, a new de-escalation policy for law enforcement in Escondido. And being that I live in Escondido, I definitely wanted to make sure that we got there first, and we did. Uh, there is a policy, and when you have policy versus training, if an officer breaks policy, he can lose his job. If he breaks training, he gets retrained. So we want to step it up a notch and say, look, these, these officers need to understand that um, giving people their dignity and giving them their, their rights as a human being is part of your job as an officer, and here it is in our policy. One of the things that I, two of the things that I think is great about that policy in Escondido is one, pre-engagement, and two, de-engagement. De and then in, in between there is de-escalation. We all understand de-escalation. So I'm gonna just talk about these two ends, the three, the three components. Pre-engagement is, it commands or demands that the officer, when they arrive to the scene, if it's convenient, when they arrive at the scene to decompress from their last call, Maybe somebody was really violent to them. Maybe somebody was really disparaging the badge and all these kind of things. But when they come to this next call, it might be something totally different and they don't need to bring that baggage with them. Decompress, evaluate the situation to see even if law enforcement is necessary. Maybe it's mental health. Maybe it's homelessness and they need a homelessness team. Maybe there's many other things. So that's in pre-engagement. De-engagement is very important. I never thought I'd see it in my lifetime, actually. But with officers to say, if there's no law being broken here and everything is settled, just to get out of Dodge, you know, go on and do other police duties because communities of color have just police presence causes tension. And the longer you expose yourself to that community that already don't trust you, that is already afraid of you, it becomes a militarizing feeling and then the people are gonna respond. So in the policy, it says that do not consider this a retreat. If they're not breaking the law, let's say if they're just angry or something and they're throwing all kinds of profanities, but I mean, and, and they won't do what you say as far as calm down and go in the house and go on the porch. You can't really tell them to do that anyway. That's not, they have a right to walk the streets, right? So um, if they're not breaking any law to leave, and maybe that will de-escalate the situation, <clears throat> especially when it comes to law enforcement. We've seen where law enforcement makes the mistake of touching someone who will not comply. Like, let's say put their hand on them or at, at, at minimum, let's say they put their hand on them. Well, if you know a person, they're, they're homeless, homelessness has a high pr presence of mental health concerns. And if you put your hand on some mental health people, they're gonna react. So then the situation was escalated unnecessarily, especially if there's no crime going on. So I found those things very important and I think they're gonna be game changers. Uh, and um, Carlsbad is coming up next. They, we're, we're meeting with them, but we've also met with Vista. We've met with um, Oceanside. We've met with Encinitas. We've met with so many cities. Poway is on the map. We haven't met with Poway yet. Sorry, St. Bart's, but we're coming. But um, we've met with all these cities and they have been, especially after George Floyd, they have been receptive. Um, and, and, and by the way, at this, this press, we did a press conference when this was released. And at that press conference, there was me from the North County Equity and Justice Coalition, Mr. Rob Jenkins from the North County NAACP, which I'm also a member of, and also Mr. Max Disposti, who is the founder and chairperson of the LGBTQ Resource Center. So I, I brought that up just to say that, you know, I'm, I walk it like I talk it, and I'm not a liberal Muslim. This is Islam. This is Islam. Even a couple years ago at the LGBTQ Center, sorry to go back on the same, that uh, earlier question, but we delivered backpacks uh, to the LGBTQ Resource Center for homeless uh, LGBTQ uh, representatives as a, a, a human warmth gift 
that they can use the supplies inside. It wasn't just empty backpacks. We put clothes, hygiene products, snacks, and all kinds of things because uh, LGBTQ, they have a high rate of, of human trafficking and sexual abuse on the streets when they're homeless. So we brought all of these things to them. And a lot of my Christian and Muslim brothers were like, hey, we thought, you know, this is LGBTQ. What are you doing over there? It's like, look, this is Benny Adam. This is what this is. This is Benny Adam and I encourage all of you to do the same. So if someone is harmed just for being LGBTQ, that is my problem. It is my problem. So um, th these are the kind of things, interfaith, uh, um, like we're doing now, uh, the Poway Interfaith Team, which is here with you, uh, St. Bart. Also the Escondido Together uh, Interfaith Team, the San Diego Regional Interfaith Collaborative, the Interfaith for Worker Justice, the Interfaith for Environmental Justice, um, and so many others, the San Diego Interfaith Ministerial Association. All of these are interfaith groups throughout San Diego, and there's many more. So we have to be engaged in all these different levels to make sure that we are making an impact. And I believe at all these different levels, uh, the environment and uh, science and all these things, they need to see a hijab and they need to see a kufi, the thing I wear on my head that's in that picture. Um, they need to see that, to realize that Muslims are involved in the community. They are your neighbors. They are your brothers and sisters. And that's why whenever I'm there, I don't have to wear that head covering. It's not mandatory in my religion. I want people to know that Muslims are here when there's some justice needs to be had. When families are, 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 are displaced out of their home and kicked out because they can't pay their rent, you need to see some Muslims there fighting for them to be sheltered and be home, housed. For children who are being um, uh, abused or foster children, you need to see the Muslim community in places at the border. You need to see Muslims there because we are one family, in fact, and people need to see it in their reality. So uh, there, there are so many uh, things that, that uh, I, I'm the founder of Mosques Against Trafficking, which is the human trafficking I alluded to. And I'm a part of the San Diego Regional uh, anti-human trafficking and commercial sexual exploitation of children advisory council for the county. And this is where we, we, we put together these backpacks. And here's, here's a, a beautiful segue to this story is that when we made these backpacks, it was just Muslims. We've made about 60 of them. It was just an idea. We put it together and we handed it out to the police departments and the LGBTQ center and all these different places as a warm gift. Our brothers and sisters in the Christian tradition in the Jewish tradition, in the Buddhist tradition, all of them said, how can we help? How can we do this? It turned from that first day into an interfaith gathering. People brought their kids and their, their families. We did a presentation on what human trafficking is in San Diego. And it's a huge annual interfaith gathering. And we put together, build these backpacks. And, and then now we have so many, we have to give it to East County, we have to give it to South Bay, we have to give it to Escondido, Oceanside, LGBTQ Center, uh, um, uh, homeless shelters for children, all those kinds of resources. And just to get rid of them. Sometimes there are people like, you still got more? I'm like, I'm trying, wait, you know, so much generosity from the community. So there is a lot of areas to be, that needs our attention and it needs more of us. Thank you. Yusuf, who would have thought? It's like, we've got too much abundance here. Please, please help us um, spread it out. Um, what, what occurs to me, um, and, and this is not a conversation for tonight because we're getting to the end, but it's like in lieu of the shootings in um, Atlanta and Boulder, that um, there is a lot of work that we all need to do about um, gun violence and, and the many things uh, that we have to address or the, or the things that, that drive people to even engage in such behavior. Before I um, let man go, are there any more questions or, or thoughts or, okay, before I go on, come on people, no. okay. Well, Mark, of course. <laughs> well, I have to say hello, my brother. Hello, Yusuf. How are you, my friend? Hello. <laughs> Good to see you again. 
Uh, it's good to be seen. And uh, again, thank you for your ministry with Interfaith. And uh, I'm a little uh, overwhelmed by the amount of ministries you're involved in um, in North County. And I'm grateful for all your offerings and your sacrifices. It just occurred to me, though I've known you now for many years, um, I didn't fully appreciate that you served in the United States military. Were you there for a full career? Yes, I was there for 24 years, brother. Thank you very much. 24 years active duty with service in Iraq and Afghanistan. And what was your what was your area in the military? I was a combat medic, so the medical field. All right. I, I, I'm just embarrassed I didn't know that before tonight. Kate was whispering in her ear, how did you not know that? <laughs> career. Um, but uh, so thank you for your service to our country. And uh, that explains a lot to me why how, how you're able to speak with confidence with multiple layers in our communities of, of power, of different structures, um, different um, goals, and yet to see a common purpose amongst everyone. And so uh, again, grateful for your leadership and more importantly, grateful for your, um, your support of St. Bartholomew's and our attempt here to just um, to give thanks for what we do share in common. Um, and I, I give thanks for how you presented tonight. It's a, it's, a, it's a, for me at least tonight. Even though I've heard you speak before many a time, tonight it um, this talk has resonated in my heart. My heart needed to hear this. Let me put it that way. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, brother Mark. I always love seeing you. I miss your face. Hopefully, after this COVID, we can meet in person, all of us at St. Bart's, and uh, it's just a wonderful experience. I consider St. Bart's another home for me. So uh, I can't wait to see you all again. And um, as, as was mentioned earlier, sorry to take up too much time, but as it was mentioned earlier, our, our is issues in uh, Atlanta in our AAPI brothers and sisters and the issue that happened in Boulder, it reminds me of a, a, a verse in the Quran that Allah says, we created you from a single pair, a man and a woman, separated you into tribes and nations, so that you may recognize one another, not to despise one another. I'm adding this part, not to despise one another. He said to recognize one another. And what do we do when we recognize one another? We appreciate the differences that we have, that we see. So when we see someone who is black, who is Asian, or who are any other persuasion, that we should say glory to God that he is such a creator, he's such a fashioner, that he made this person different from what I see in the mirror every day. And I'm going to, as an expression of his love and his mercy and his creative power, go find out all about that person, where they're from, what they do. Maybe they're right here from America. It doesn't matter. Go get in touch with the creative power and diverse power of our Lord. My spiritual director, Yusuf, once taught me um, a spiritual exercise, uh, back to Allison's comment earlier of our need for doing some more work on our spiritual uh, development. And that was, um, he challenged me once when I went on a retreat, which required an airplane ride. He said, every time you see another person, look in their eyes and see Christ. And don't see Jesus Christ in them to convert them to Christianity. Rather see your God and that other person. And then smile at God and welcome God. Perhaps that resonates with you as well. Panala, that was beautiful. So um, Yusef, I, I, two things, Mark is not, um, I've not said this to Mark before, but I'm hoping maybe at some point you could join us um, to proclaim our sermon. Yes. Um, and, uh, and be with what, us on- What does on that mean? I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. What do you mean you don't know what I'm talking about? And Come on, so, preacher. <laughs> so on Saturday and Sundays is when we have our religious services and we have a message. Mm -hmm. And if you might be willing at some point to give your message to us, I think that would be amazing. I would love to. It would be my honor. Thank you so much. Oh, absolutely. And consider yourself asked we'll just I'll, I'll be in touch to find out when and the last thing i want to do tonight is we're asking our, our our speakers to um give us a prayer from their tradition 
Um, you have blessed us tonight so much. And um, if you could pray us out tonight, that would be lovely. Thank you. <clears throat> Let us pray. In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful, thank you for such a beautiful gathering of all our beloved friends, our families here today. May you send us forth with a clearer understanding of your message as a reflection of your glory and majesty on the world. People need so much help and we have the hands to do it. Please guide us into shoring our feet to take that direction, shoring our hands to lift up a brother and sister, shoring our hearts to make sure it's genuine in the love of you and the reflection of your majesty upon the earth. Amen. Amen. Thank you, my friend. Thank you for being with us. Please now go rest and take care of yourself. And um, thank, you. thank you, everyone, for being with us tonight. Blessings.